Hi, I'm Michael Lang, and um, this is another uh, conversation in the series um, I call In Their Voices. And today I'm going to be talking with Gabriela Anaya and Julian Portilla. Welcome. Hi, Michael. Good morning. Thank you, Michael. Yes. So, um, as I um, as I like to do, I would appreciate it if each of you would take a few minutes and introduce yourselves to the viewers so they can know something that you would like them to know about you. If you want to begin, Gabriela. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. That's, that's, I always enjoy having good conversations and this sounds like can be an interesting conversation. So. My name is Gabriela Naya, as you said, and I live in, in Mexico. I'm based in Mexico City. I'm not here at the moment. Hopefully it won't be too loud because it's early in the morning. And I work with Julian and other colleagues uh, providing what we call backbone support services to a network of people who is interested in the sustainability of um, the fisheries in, in our country. Uh, my background is not in conflict resolution or facilitation. Uh, it's in natural resources management, especially in marine management. I have worked for many years now um, as a director of protected areas, running a nonprofit. And I also work as a consultant for foundations investing in nature conservation in Mexico. So, um, it seems like my one of my natural inclinations is to serve as a bridge and to bring people who normally wouldn't work, work together to work together. And that's something that I enjoy and I have done one way or the other since I started working. And now we do it you know, structurally through a network, but it just seems like one of the roads that I always end up in. And I'll stop there. Marvelous. Thank you so much, Gabriela. In that little introduction, I have so many questions that I'm curious about, but we'll see how this unfolds. Thank you so much. Julia, please. Yeah. Um, so I work at Champlain College in Burlington, Vermont, and where I teach courses in mediation and conflict resolution. That's what I call my day job. Um, but really, it represents um, probably just under half of my time, uh, the teaching part anyway. The other thing that I do is direct something called the Center for Mediation and Dialogue, through which I do a lot of uh, mediation and facilitation practice, mostly in the multi-stakeholder consensus building arena. And the initiative that Gabriela just described is, is where she and I work together, um, facilitating and weaving together this coalition of people from various parts of the fishing sector. Um, and we try to come up or, or develop the things that they have in common into proposals for either the private sector or the public sector, um, and also the philanthropic sector and try to, uh, try to promote things that are, that are common to them. I also work uh, mediating uh, on the roster of the Inter-American Development Bank. All the multilateral banks have conflict resolution mechanisms, or most of them, I should say, not all of them. Um, and oftentimes, if a multilateral bank um, has uh, implements projects that have effects on local peoples, they have the right for redress if they feel like they haven't been treated fairly. And so one of the things I do with the Inter-American Development Bank is mediate in Haiti, uh, between a group of farmers who was displaced by uh, a factory, um, an industrial park, and, uh, and the government of Haiti and the bank. Um, so that's another thing that I do in the mediation world. And um, the other piece it has to do with, uh, with projects around, in and around Vermont, uh, local nonprofits that are developing uh, strategic plans or having internal conflicts with one another or trying to figure out what their next steps are or how to, how to work in coalition with others, school boards, um, issues related to uh, racial justice and social change as well, uh, a smattering of things, I guess. Wow, Julian, thanks so much. Um, I'm so delighted to be able to talk with you uh, because I know only a tiny amount of what the two of you have been working on with the fisheries, fisheries industry in uh, Mexico. 
And I wonder if you could um, um, give me a, a provide uh, the viewers a sense of how this began. How how did you two even get involved in this project? What was the what, what initiated it? Should I go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Well, you were you were you were there in the beginning. Why don't you start, and then I can I can uh, I can chime in with with what it looked like for me. Uh, that you were there in the beginning sounds really. But it started in a way that was perhaps not the perfect or the most ideal way, Michael. Uh, but one that I appreciate that I am familiar with because I also work in the philanthropic sector. It started with a donor who has invested in fishery sustainability, and when I say invest, is supporting the work of local nonprofits, asking the question to some of, of, of their grantees, do you think that we're doing enough? How can we scale up our impact? Shouldn't we be working in closer coordination with other sectors and other actors uh, across the value chain in fisheries to scale up our impact? So it began as a conversation between a donor and its grantees. And the conversation led to the conclusion that, yes, what we're doing is, I mean, we're doing a really good job, but we have not perhaps collaborated enough with other sectors. And some of the things we want to achieve in order to, to truly transform the, the, the fisheries industry has to be done in close coordination with producers, people who commercialize uh, seafood with, with local communities. And that's where it began. We, um, that's when I contacted Julian, with whom I had not worked in the past, but he was my teacher because I took several you know, workshops with him on the tools that we are now using. I contacted him we, and we work with uh, another woman who is a master uh, planner. She's fantastic in logistics and in just in, in, in structuring. Uh, she has complementing capacities, I would say, and skills to Julian and mine. So we served as conveners to that more diverse group of people that began. When was it, Julian? I always get confused about the days. Like, 2017 is, is what I just is what Google Photos just told me the other day. Mm -hmm. 2017 was the first multi-stakeholder meeting, and we've been refining and bringing new people and structuring that initial network to what it is at this moment. And I think it's one of the most diverse networks, at least for fisher sustainability, working in Latin America. What did I miss, Julian? I'm, I'm curious, how did you, how, how did you, because one of the challenges in doing multi-stakeholder conversations, let's just call it that for, for, the, for its breadth, that one of the challenges is bringing people to the table, identifying the, the key people, some, some of the key people and the key stakeholders who, um, who would be interested in and necessary to the success of the of the venture? How did you go about doing that? I think we used or we rely heavily initially, at least, and the social capital of the participants, of the foundation, and of us as conveners. Uh, there is there is lack of trust in the sector, so that that has been one of the challenges, uh, especially between uh, a sector of the of the industry and nonprofits. So at the beginning, I think we relied on the social capital of of people. So I I used to work in the nonprofit sector. I had a significant level of social capital with um, nonprofits. Uh, the foundation had a close relationship with other actors, so they played a role. And, and, and slowly we have moved from personal relations to 
I think the gravitas of the own network uh, and the convenient power of the network in itself. But honestly, that has taken time. That, that's my take on it. What do you think, Julian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say the, the short answer is that we asked <laughs> who, who needs to be here. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then, and then we went, and and a lot of people that we asked showed up. Some of them did not, and I think that the um, your point, Gabriela, about the network taking on its own weight is 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 right on. And as it takes on its own weight, then it starts the the gravitational pull becomes such that the people who may not have participated on day one uh, participate now. Um, and some people who were there on day one decided it wasn't for them, and that's fine, and they left. And we sort of created our own little ecosystem of, uh, of actors that is not the same as it was on day one, and I'm sure that in, you know, in a year's time, it'll be different even than it looks now. Yeah, it's fascinating to me because we, so, so many times we don't think about the idea that social capital, as you've said, Gabriela, is the initiating process that the that human connection knowing people having some familiarity with one another is what um, brings people to the table as as the uh, beginning force as the catalyst for building something larger it's quite unique i think i haven't heard of any other circumstance like that uh, i think there's a sense of urgency is also, I mean, can also bring people together. And, and in this case, there was a sense of urgency, but the lack of trust run deep into the system. So even if, if, if various parts identify the need for you know, working differently or doing work in a, in a different way, just the lack of trust makes it very difficult, even if you recognize the urgency. So you need something that brings you together. And if you already have some level of trust mm -hmm. in someone, it's just easier to at least sit and begin the conversation. Um, yeah. But of course, that has to be transformed into something that pulls people by, by itself and it doesn't rely on you know whoever Julian knows or whoever I know, or even the, the convenient capacity of the, of the donor of the initial donor, because that can actually work, that can compromise the long-term functioning of the network. Because the assumption is that the donor may have uh, its own agenda and that the purpose of the convening is to meet the donor's agenda rather than the donor being generous and having a purely philanthropic interest. Exactly, and that has taken time to, um, I think, I don't know about other countries, but distrusting the intention of something, it's something I think common sometimes in Latin America. And a donor, just knowing that a donor convened an initiative can actually you know, make people understand that it's the agenda of the donor. And in this case, at least, one of our roles has been to make sure that what, what the donor is doing is they trust or they are investing in collaboration as a means to transform a system. And it's also a learning process for the young funder because most of the funding takes place at the individual level. I mean, I, I support a nonprofit and the relationship is between, you know, the donor and the nonprofit. This is a different way of working for foundations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Michael, let me chime in there to say that Gabriela, has had one, of, one of the great strengths of working with Gabriela is that she is um, she's very clear about when to be firm and with what, uh, when, when to be very assertive. And so there, there had been moments in our collaboration where um, in very good faith, various actors have made different propositions, including the donors, and, and Gabriela has been very careful to ensure that we never give the perception, especially with the donors, that, that the donor is driving the agenda. And, and those, have been, those have been some really important learning moments for me uh, where I, I, I might not have withstood that pressure. I think Gabriela's experience in the philanthropic world uh, allows her to really uh, be sensitive to those moments when we might be 
um, being perceived as being uh, manipulated or, or driven rather by the, by the donor. Um, e even in times when it might be a coincident interest, you know, where there may be common interest to what the donor wants, just the, the, the optics and, and the ways in which um, we present things and talk about things and the, the ways in which we collaborate. Gabriela is always very, very careful to make sure um, that it doesn't appear that the, um, that the donor is, is driving the agenda, which in fact they're, they're not because of Gabriela's good stewardship. And um, we've been very fortunate to have donors who understand that and, and who have, have learned with us in this process how to, how to manage this thing a little bit differently than a typical um, donation or a typical grant to, to an individual organization, I would say. So, so describe how that's different, because I think this is, you know, when people talk about their work as, um, as conveners and managers of a dialogue process, a conversation, um, the focus is on the interaction between the convener and the stakeholders. How do you manage and you know what happens when this occurs and what happens? And, and it's all about what which is critical, of course, the work of the convener with respect to the stakeholders. But you're describing another layer, another uh, role in effect for the convener, which is managing the relationship, um, uh, negotiating the relationship with the donor. And that's quite different, I think. Um. I think that it's different. Uh, myself, I work for a foundation in the U.S. and part of the, part of my time. And a grant, it depends on the philanthropic approach of whoever the donor is. But in general, let's say a, a general support grants are easier. You're just supporting the work of an organization. But most grants are attached to specific deliverables or products that are not necessarily processes. And process, managing process, as you know, Michael, it's, uh, it's hard to frame it in the form of an outcome. So it's, it's, it takes a perception shift to understand that some milestones along a process are actually a product. That is not you know, number of meetings. No, no, I'm talking about building trust. Well, that's a product. Of course. Uh, if you have a common agenda, even if it's a broad one, well, that's a product. But it, it's not um, not necessarily not all of the funders understand the difference that you're betting on processes. The other difference that I recognize is we're actually not an, a formal nonprofit. It's a network. It's an informal, so to speak. We don't have a legal uh, figure. We have a, a fiscal sponsor. And that's a difference in itself. You might as a donor have the temptation to put pressure on other grantees to participate in the network, but that can work against the interest of the network. So there is plenty of subtleties uh, that we have to be very careful about. In, in, Of course, we require funding, and that's something that it's often ignored. Some processes do arise in the absence of facilitation or someone actually doing the, the, the work of convening, mediating. Uh, in my opinion, multi-stakeholder collaborations require a team of people who is responsible for providing services to the network. And that, of course, requires investment. Sure. Of course it does. And, and and it is a challenge, isn't it, with the donors to, to talk about deliverables or product or how do you measure um, success? Uh, you know, I, in, in my world, which is, uh, is more limited in terms of the numbers of people who are ever involved, even then, the question is, how long is this going to take? What are we going to get at the end of this? I mean, people who come in for um, you know, a workplace dispute and they think, well, okay, a couple of hours, that, do you need any more than that? And you know, um, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, because it's oh, not up yeah. to me. I don't get to, and, and you with dealing with a variety of individuals who represent a wide array of stakeholders it's even more challenging to be able to say to a donor, um, 
you can expect this, 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 and this to occur. It is a constant challenge. And I think I struggle each time that we have to write a grant proposal. It doesn't stop. It, um, it also takes one, I think we have been, I'm going to say lucky or successful at securing funding in the medium term for the initiative because the funder is also part of the network. Okay. And that has been critical. I mean, some people, even some consultant, a recent consultant that worked for us, he was, he was really intrigued uh, about the presence of the donor. I think that is positive because one, that person, whoever is, is uh, learning along the process with us, she is aware of the challenges and, and progress made, so it's easier to have an honest and deep conversation with her because she understands what we are doing. And I think that has made a big difference. What's your impression, Julian, and, um, or, or even about the perception of other participants of having the donor being part of the network? Yeah, I, I think that it has become a non-issue. <laughs> and, and at first it, it, was, it was an issue, um, particularly for those whose organizations depend on, on grants from, from the donor organization. Um, you know, it's one thing if I ask you, Michael, to participate in a network, um, and it's another thing if I ask you to participate in a network and I pay your salary, <laughs> then it, it sounds like a different kind of request. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, it, I, I think it's a great testament to the fact that, that it has become a non-issue. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think, I think, I think it's gone very well. I, I was reminded of a conversation I had one time facilitating a, a network in, in Argentina uh, about a land conflict um, that, were, that involved public land. And, um, and I, I'll never forget this interview that I did with the local radio in, in the town in which we were working. And they said, okay, so Julian, you're, you're the mediator for the situation, right? I said, yeah. I said, well, what, what's the solution for this thing? How are we gonna solve it? I, said, I, don't, I don't know. And we're, we're that's that's why I'm here. We're gonna we're gonna you know we're talking to people and it's, it's up to them to come up with something. Said, oh, okay, okay. Well, who are you who are you rooting for? Like, do you think do you think uh, do you think the occupants are right or do you think the mayor is right? Said, well, you know, it's not really for me to say. I don't really have an opinion about who's right. The point is less about who's right and more about what's possible in order to get um, you know the city what it needs and to get the the occupants what they need. Said, oh, okay, all right. He said, well, well, who's paying you then? Said, well, there's this. There's this uh, foundation, you know, this Hewlett Foundation, and they pay for work like this. Said, well, do they have land here? Said, no, no, they've never been to you. You know this place. They don't. They've never been here. Oh, so let me get this straight. You don't have a solution for the problem. You don't favor any of the parties, and nobody's paying you to be here. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and it was very hard for them to understand this sort of ghost role that we play. Uh, and, and the strangeness of our, our influence and our trust coming from the fact that we have no power <laughs> in the given situation. That is the only reason that anybody trusts us is because we, we don't have actually the power to make any decisions for them. Uh, other, and if we did, they, would, they probably wouldn't show up to our meeting more than once. The great irony of our role. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, go ahead, please, Gabriel. I'm sorry, I just wrote, do you remember that time that we were making calls to invite them? And them? In that case, it was a nonprofit. And I was trying to explain what we were trying to achieve through the network. And uh, the director of the nonprofit said, Gabriela, what you're saying sounds like philosophy or poetry. It doesn't sound like a methodology for work. So even not only among founders, but even among nonprofits, collaboration, I think, is a still an evolving animal, something that we are understanding the role it plays and how it complements individual work. But um, it's not always easy to convey the importance of just sitting on the same table with other people. So I imagine <clears throat> that a fair amount of your work initially was educating um, the, the stakeholders, the, the people who were either willing to participate or considering participation about your role 
And uh, just as Julian described in his uh, example in Argentina, for you to be able to talk with the stakeholders and, and describe why this is a useful process when what most people think of when they sit down at a table is negotiation. It's just bargaining. And that, um, and that well, aren't you part of the bargaining then? What side, as, as Julian said, you know, what side are you on? So how, how much time and effort did it require to be able to uh, explain your role, the ghost role, the, the present but invisible person? Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think a lot of it, you know, like, like good writing, it's a, lot, it's a lot of doing instead of explaining. Um, and so we, we, we certainly do, do a lot of explaining to when, when people uh, come uh, and before they come and as we're trying to get them to come and sit down. And then, and then I think, I think the, the persuasion is really in the doing, you know, and, and them seeing that, in fact, we aren't, we aren't making decisions, that, they, that we do consult them, that the documents that we create reflect the things that they've said to us, um, and that really we rely on them. Here's another funny thing, um, you know, neither Gabriela nor I are experts in fishing, nor, nor is our other, well, actually, four out of five colleagues on our team are, are not fishing experts. Uh, in fact, no, I'm sorry, all five of us are not, are not fishing experts. So there, there's another way in which our, our um, role is a little bit surprising to people who might, um, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, our, our lack of specific um, sort of scientific expertise in the field is another way that, that we actually gain credibility because we, we, we would be unable to uh, persuade someone to a particular scientific uh, position or management position in terms of fisheries management um, because we're wholly unqualified to do that and we don't pretend to be qualified to do that. Um, however, we're very good at understanding where people's concerns lie. And, and the things that make people nervous uh, in any particular conversation. And, and that I think is something that, that puts people at ease when they hear that we are naming the things that they are concerned about. I think that puts them at ease in the middle of a conversation without necessarily rushing in to tell them what they should be doing. Oh, you're concerned about um, uh, you know, this particular fishery in this particular area? Well, what you need to be doing is X, Y, and Z. You know, we're, we're unqualified to say that, so we'd say, Oh, you're concerned about this particular fishery in this particular area in this particular way. That's that's um, that's a common concern that I've heard from X other person. Does anybody have any other ideas about how this might happen? How has this been solved elsewhere? You know the usual questions that you might ask if you were in this third party role, um, which fortunately for us is quite easy to do because we're we're, we're completely um, unqualified to do anything else in terms of answering the the things that are out there. So I think just showing the role is probably even more useful than talking about it. I think people are willing enough to come, not necessarily because we tell them uh, and they understand what's gonna happen, but A, because there's other people that they trust at the table who are not us. And we can always say, you know, this person, that person, this person are gonna be there. Don't you think you wanna be there? Okay, great. And then when they show up and actually feel the way that it goes, then I think they start to settle in a little bit. Even so, there are certain moments when people will 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 send emails or or texts or or uh, grapevineish kind of messages that that express a little bit of concern about what we're doing. So I, I can think uh, Gabriela of the time when I when uh, normally we like to when when we do press interactions we try to have a, a representative group um, of the group go up and and speak and then one of us goes and sort of shepherds the conversation with the media. Every now and then one of us is asked to speak directly with the media. And when that happens, inevitably, there is a, a little bit of blowback from the people about that we work with thinking, oh, now these guys are experts. How does that work? And so then we have to do a little damage control. And we have to be very careful about our, our media and our public persona, really, um, because at every point, we want to show that, that it's a we and not just a, 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 a me and Gabriela and, and Paulina and Ana and Mara, our little team. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's one of our challenges, I would say. I, I, I agree. I think that education is through the doing and it can be rushed. At the beginning, I think some of us, at least William and I, felt a little distressed and concerned that people might not understand our role. I remember a few frustrated conversations between us. Uh, but as 
as we moved forward, I think that the, the clarity about the role is it's, it's higher. And we, in a way, we are in the process of testing it because I, I play the role of I coordinate the initiative and we just open a call for applications because I'm going to leave the initiative in a few months and someone else will join the initiative and coordinate the initiative. And I'm working closely with the, steering, the initiative steering committee and, and we're going to begin interviewing people. And of course it has, we have spent a number of hours talking about my specific role and the role of the, of the, of the backbone team. And in our most recent call, uh, El Chino, Julian, who is a fishing leader that we admire profoundly, he was so clear about our role. He was saying, okay, okay, so if someone is applying who has a deep level of understanding of fishing, I mean, I can understand the value of that, but it's not what is essential. We need a person who knows how to relate with people, who doesn't have an agenda, who knows how to convene people, speak to various people, even if they have different perspectives. Someone who is going to, even if he or she doesn't know about fishers that will learn fast like Julian did, he said that. Uh, but that overall is going to know how to deal with the human side of collaboration. I was, I was so happy with that conversation because it reflected a deep, deep understanding of what we do in a person who plays a critical role in the industry. And he's not just participating in this collaborative, he works across the number of initiatives and, and, and now he brings that knowledge of the value of having someone no, neutral helping a process. I was extremely happy. That made my day. Sure. That was some pride. <laughs> One of the things that I wonder about, and um, and maybe people who are viewing this will, will wonder as well, what does it, and I'm thinking about the distinction between showing and telling, right? So draw, uh, give us a picture of what the convening place and people and you know what does it look like um and then i have i just have so many other questions this is just really fascinating but i thought maybe that as a as a way of grounding so people would understand i would understand but the viewers would understand as well what it is that you it helps i think explain what you do if they understand what you look at when you stand up in front of a group of people who are they how many where do you do this how do you so, Gabriela, can you sort of fill, fill us in? Sure. So in the network, we have um, people who produce, meaning, you know, fishers, uh, uh, organized in fishing organizations. So we have the two, um, the two confederations that bring together most of the additional fishers across the country are part of the initiative. We have a number of nonprofits. <laughs> they still dominate the number. We have a lot of nonprofits participating in the network. Um, we're trying to bring more restaurants. We have one of the leading restaurants in Mexico City participating in the network. Um, intermediaries, how many do we have? Yeah, I'd say there's half a dozen or eight um, supply chain folks other than fishers and restaurants or yeah, the, the intermediary part of the chain, the middle part of the chain. Uh -huh. And we're trying to make a special effort to have like complementing processes addressing the specific needs of a subsector. And we are highly structured, Michael. When when we talk about collaboration, some people might think that it's just like a you know an organic way, and it is organic in a way, but it requires a structure. So everyone that is part of the initiative, we call it the assembly, and the assembly meets at least twice a year remotely or in presence, of course, lately, remotely. And, and we have a number of work groups on the various topics that we that our common agenda includes. So we have a work group that brings, it's also very diverse, that is working on governance issues, another one working on market issues, and another one working on social well-being of, 
of fishing communities. There is a fourth emerging group working on climate change. We have a steering committee that kind of looks at the forest and other individual trees. Uh, and a gender, a newly created, how, how do you say that in English? It's not a gender. Yeah, gender inclusion, gender sensitivity, <laughs> all things related to gender. Yeah. Uh, and the final committee is uh, works closely with us on evaluation and learning. And all of the various groups have subgroups that Julian and Mara facilitate. So we ended up with a very broad um, array of dialogue structures that meet the work groups are in the process of developing their work plans. It's highly structured and we communicate on a daily basis. Um, we use WhatsApp a lot. All of the groups have a WhatsApp group and they communicate and exchange information pretty much every day. I don't think there is a day, even during the weekend sometimes, <laughs> and when people are not communicating. And, um, and each meeting is facilitated by either Julian or Mara or they, the, the two of them together. They are the facilitators of the initiative. What else about the structure? Yeah, I think that's right. So when we used to meet in person, you know, we'd meet in a room of about 40 people. Um, and and when, when the big, when the assembly, the, the, the whole group was there, and then we would break off into little groups. One of the things that we have discovered is that um, through the pandemic is that, is that the, the Zoom calls can actually uncork a lot of the bottlenecks of scheduling that we used to have when we were trying to do things in person. So. I think as we come out of this, we'll probably maintain a fair amount of the, the adaptations that we've had to make in COVID because uh, I think it's actually, it's, it's agile, it's, um, it's less travel, it's less expensive. And, and, and the, in Mexico, Michael, there are two primary fishing sectors. There's, there's the industrial sector, which works on big boats um, and is very well organized and is, is, has, a, has a fair amount of capital behind it. Then there's the artisanal section, sector, which are people who, who fish in their communities and whose livelihoods depend solely on fishing. And they may or may not be great business people. There's a wide variety, a wide diversity among, among artisanal fishers. And the confederations that Gabriela mentioned over this pandemic have really embraced this technology to have their national meetings that they used to have in person. They used to travel around like a traveling circus to all these various regions of the country, meeting with the various federations and occasionally representatives would all meet together and, and they have adopted uh, a lot of Zoom technologies and have, have become very savvy about using uh, various forms of technology to organize themselves. So, so in a lot of ways, I think that um, what it looks like has changed um, from the time that we started to the time now, and in, and in some ways, the pandemic has modernized some parts of, this, of the sector that, that we would not have predicted um, in this way if we had been on a normal pandemic-free timeline. So it's actually nurtured more communication in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, though, though I would also say, I think, I, I definitely feel like there's been broader, more frequent communication. We may have lost some depth to the communication because it is, it's very hard to sustain lots of attention over Zoom for a long time, as you know. So there <clears> are, you know, the usual complaints about the, the lack of hallway conversations and the sort of after meetings, sit around the coffee or with, a, with an adult beverage to make those sort of deeper, profound, informal slash formal, you know, blend, blended uh, business and pleasure conversations and relationship building opportunities that we used to have. We, we don't have those, but, but there has, there's been sort of a compensation in terms of the breadth of communication, I would say. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I will add on the structure is that I think by now the initiative, the network, it's, uh, let's call it that, like a universe in itself, you know, with, with the work groups and all of the interactions that we help facilitate. But even so, and even if it's diverse, we don't, we still don't have a full representation of the perspectives that exist in the fishing sector, or we don't have, we can't cover all of what, it's, what, what has to be done. So we're now exploring, Michael, something that we call alliance with alliances. 
meaning that the network in itself can collaborate with other networks and initiatives and somehow find uh, common ground and have some level of coordination that is not as frequent as the coordination we have within the network in itself, but expand our, our, our impact. So we're pilot testing this way of working, hopefully this year with another initiative taking form in, 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 in Mexico. And we also just um, became part of the, my God, I should remember the name of the network that we just signed it. The, the Seafood Alliance. The, uh, the, the Alliance for the Conservation of Sustainable Seafood. Mm -hmm. And see oh, the Conservation Alliance. Ooh, let's figure that out. CAS, C A S S. I know. Let's make sure not to send the link to this interview to them. So that's so, the next step. I'm really intrigued because you, this venture or adventure, uh, both, has been uh, going on for four years. And, um, and I have two things that I'm curious about. One is how, how you are able to sustain attention, momentum, commitment, involvement over that period of time. And the other question is what's diff what has had to change over time, in other you started with an initial structure and plan and so on, and how has it evolved over the, because it's a long period of time um, and a lot happens that, that as facilitators, as the backbone, as you said, you have to respond to. That's a great question. Honestly, I think that for years, it's it's a long period of time for a collaboration and not even close enough to get to significant results. Because some of the changes we're trying to achieve are long term, I mean, require, I mean, are achieved in the long term, not less than five years. But there is a constant tension because, of course, it's participating in the network. It's something that people do in addition to what they do for their business or confederation or nonprofit, and all of their plates are already full. So adding time to to participate in our network, it's um, I mean, you have to get something out of it. And when I say something out of it, is just to get a sense that what we're doing is valuable and adds to what they do. Honestly, I think that. This is a very personal view. Of course, we do we do whatever we can to maintain the dynamic of the network and to help the group address issues that are of common interest. There is an additional factor that I think has played out in the network and it's a political context. When in a political context, you have a sense that your voice is likely going to be heard uh, by itself, then the incentive to participate in a network is not there. If you can achieve most of what you want by yourself, why bother to invest additional time collaborating with others? But in some political context or just systemic context in which some issues are better have a better chance of being heard and in the public arena when your voice is part of a group that is more diverse and legitimate to the eyes of the agencies responsible for ensuring the sustainability of fisheries, then I think there is an additional incentive to stay. Uh, what do you think, Julian? Oh yeah, no, I think that's right. I think I think anytime people can do achieve what they want to achieve by themselves, they're going to do it <laughs> before they come sit down and spend a lot of time um, talking with others about how they see things in common, for sure. So yeah, I, I think that um, I also think that our gravitational pull, if you like, it, it sort of ebbs and flows. There, there are moments when everybody wants to come together and, and come up with common things. And there are times when 
they're, they're, they're happier doing their own thing. And they often coincide with major changes or shifts or threats from uh, either the private sector or the public sector. Um, so there's a new policy that's being developed that's gonna cause some controversy. There's a movement afoot to uh, close off an enormous fishing ground uh, and generates a lot of interest. There is a boycott coming from the United States <laughs> that's gonna cause a lot of movement. There, there are sort of big moments when people say, <clears throat> uh-oh, this is bigger than, than us. We need to come together and, and, and talk about it. Which brings us into a really interesting tension that we've been managing since the beginning, which is there, are, I, I, I conceive of our general challenges as, as kind of along two dimensions. One is the short term versus the long term. Uh, we basically exist in order to achieve long-term changes. Gabriela was saying, um, if we're working at this scale, the system level scale, you, you, it's very hard to work at a system level scale if you have to attend to sort of short-term immediate crises. But it's very hard to hold people's attention if you're not at least um, engaging somewhat in the sort of short and medium term crises as they evolve. Um, and I actually think that addressing some of the short and medium term things collectively is, is actually a strategy to maintain the vision on that long term engagement, Michael, as, as you were asking. So that's, that's one of the challenges. And I think that's one of the ways that we have de facto, it wasn't by design, but we sort of learned that, that we needed to really engage in the sort of short and medium term things mm, at, to, to keep the long term focus, ironically. And I think the other big challenge that we have is, is, is the scale at which we work. Um, fisheries are typically organized either by region or by, by fishery, meaning species. You know, I'm a tuna fisher, I'm a, I'm a clam fisher, I'm a lobster fisher, those kinds of things. And, and our initiative really works neither by region nor by fishery. We, we have sort of a national scope and all fishery, which is a very um, unusual approach uh, and for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to maintain the focus on something so broad like that. Um, and so again, I, I think the same is true for that piece as well, that, that we, we have tried to respond to medium and short term things and also more specifically regional and fisheries level um, issues with an eye toward, okay, here's, here's the thing that is in the short and medium term. How does this fit into the broader picture? How is this a symptom of something broader that we would like to address in our, in our policy? Um, and also kind of market private sector approach. So, but it, it does require you then to address and, and perhaps come up with uh, policies or solutions or proposals on the short term or medium term in order to keep people engaged and focused and, and, and recognize that there are valuable long-term objectives that can be achieved if the group stays attentive, together, focused on, on those issues. That's exactly right, because I, I think it can seem very tone deaf if we're not um, responding to those things. So, so I'll give you a real concrete example. We, we, um, it, fishing enforcement is, um, is, a, is a big problem in Mexico. It's, a, it's sort of a medium to low governance context relative to, to global context. It's actually quite advanced relative to some, but quite weak relative to others. So I, I guess we're a solid middle, middle, middle governance state, you might call it. Um, and we've been looking at this sort of broad systems level approach to fishing enforcement, which doesn't just have to do with how many fishing enforcement officers are in the water, but what the relationship to the communities are, to the enforcement agencies, the culture of, um, of rule following, the sense of uh, collectivism around this common resource. You know, it's a broad, broad uh, topic that extends into cultural things, financial things, how are you gonna pay for it? And then certainly the sort of hard nuts governance policy stuff of who, who's out there and how are they doing and what technologies are, are they using? But in the middle of all this kind of big picture stuff comes a, a, a reform bill in Congress to change the, who's gonna be the executive authority in charge of all this. And that causes all kinds of new opportunities, but also new challenges. And so all of a sudden we're stuck chasing, um, making recommendations to this short-term uh, initiative that will address some things, but is not really the crux of the issue. It's, it's being sort of handed off by the executive 
agency, there's a way to fix this um, in the face of international pressure to do more on the enforcement piece. But even if it were perfectly implemented and designed, which it's inevitably not, it still would not solve the more fundamental questions. So, so we have to address how we imagine this law or this proposal, this bill, I should say, uh, should look in the short term, but also not lose focus of the bigger picture. And it draws resources to look at that short and medium term picture that are draining and, and costly. Uh, and, and, and it take away from the time and resources that you have to convene the bigger picture um, conversations. And yet we, it would be very tone deaf of us to not address that sort of short and medium term piece. So this is challenges of, of resource investment and, and, and of the resources that we demand of the, of the participants who are involved. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's an example of this tension that we're managing. And, and to what extent, Gabriela, is the, you mentioned political, and I don't know whether you, uh, the, there are many ways to think about the, the term political, but I was thinking in particular of what Julian was just describing, and I'm wondering whether, <clears throat> whether there are government agencies who are part of the initiative, and if so, how, what sort of a role they play, and if not, do you have active engagement with them? Because it's very easy for a, a regulatory body or a legislature to do the kind of thing that, that Julian just described, and that is that can upset and distract the group, necessarily distract them from their longer term objectives. What's, how, how does that play down? That's a really good question. Government, after all, it's 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 a key part of good governance. Of fisheries, they play a key role, and they have they are we call them permanent guests of the initiative. They're not active members, but the two at least the two agencies that are that are responsible for fisheries management and fisheries research are permanent uh, guests. Of the network, they participate in assemblies uh, or in work groups, and uh, we are trying to create other spaces for dialogue with them and other government agencies, so that we have the opportunity to dive deeper, so to speak, in some topics like the one that Julian just mentioned. We um, we can have, besides their participation in the assembly, we can have special dialogues on um, fisheries enforcement, what William just mentioned. Uh, we have, uh, we realized that we needed to create, or at least for the, for the backbone team to have more, a more quick response to political conversations or things that were happening in that Congress or at the Senate. Mm -hmm. And we have, there's a group of policy advisors that provide services to the initiative. So we have people who are incredibly smart and paying attention to all of the conversations occurring at the federal level and state levels and at Congress and letting us know and analyzing topics for the network so that we can engage in, in timely dialogue with decision makers and policy makers in some of the, of the issues that are of relevance uh, for the initiative. And honestly, Michael, we are learning along the process. What's the right level of, of, of interaction with the government so that we're not just relying on government activity as a, as a path to sustainability, but also on markets and the social well-being of people. But we do pay a lot of attention and maintain um, or try to maintain a close coordination with the government. The tone of, of our network, and this is, we made the conscious decision, is of we question things, we try to be uh, meaningful and deep in our political analysis, um, but the tone of the network is of, um, how do you say that, Julian? We, we bring proposals to the table, not just complaints. So we may question, the work of the government, and we do. Uh, we push the government to work on specific topics that we believe, I mean, we collectively believe are key for
for for the sustainability of fisheries, but our tone remains propositive. If we don't have proposals, we may not engage in a conversation. And so we try to be prepared and collectively, I think we have a lot of analytical capacity and political skills that we bring to the table with the government. It's enormous. The, the task that you've undertaken is enormous and the, and the possibilities are extraordinary. Um, uh, you know, both to influence government, but, but also to build relationships among the various stakeholders, to reinforce positive relationships among them, and then to affect decisions that they make um, together. So I'm wondering, because we're coming near the end of our time, um, <clears throat> what question have I not asked that you wish I might have asked because there's something that you'd like to, to talk about that, um, that uh, we haven't yet touched on? Mm, I would say that, and, and actually, I love to pose this question to Julian because I'm not the facilitator or the professional conflict resolution expert in this network, but all of the emotional work behind this type of backbone services, you know, the type of role, the role we play in a network, facilitating, convening, mediating. Honestly, Michael, I didn't know the extent to which, I mean, how much emotional work it requires. So, I mean, that's my question, and I love it for Julian to actually answer it. How do you, I mean, what kind of emotions do you have to face in your day-to-day -day work? How do you deal with them? It's a role that puts you in a vulnerable position in a way. It's true for you too, as well as for Julian and the others, right? Um, it is. It has taken a lot of emotional work. That's perhaps what I value the most from this initiative, the, the, the personal growth. But what do you yeah. think, Julian? I mean, I think, I think you're, you're, ability to sort of address that stuff openly as as our team coordinator has been critical for us to to, to navigate through that uh yeah it's it's hard and 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 it, you, you can't do it with a thin skin you know there's there's endless um sort of suspicions and and, and ideas and opinions about how to do things differently and better and uh you know very generous feedback <laughs> from our participants that they, we, yeah, I think we had figured, been working on how to digest and, and process it for sure. Yeah, what, what do you think? I mean, uh, you know, our, our conversations together have been super important in that direction. I, I have to admit to you one time, Michael, I was ready to quit. I said, well, I think, I think maybe I'm doing, I'm not doing the initiative, the service that it needs. And I think it's time for me to go. And Gabriela said, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna get through this. Let's hang in there. So yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Gabriela? I mean, the initiative has made me doubt myself on countless occasions. I've worked since I mean, over the past 25 years in one way or the other in oceans governance. And I have had positions with I mean, of responsibility, but this is one of the, yeah, it has made me doubt myself at times. Uh, uh, it has made me more aware of my ego and when my ego is playing because we are our role is to keep our egos under control we're not there to you know we're not the leaders of this initiative we are humble service providers <laughs> and that takes a lot of you know ego control I at times I have felt the need to uh, I don't know, to, to have a voice that is more technical or more opinionated because, of course, I mean, look at me. I do have a lot of opinions. So keeping my opinions under the control and, 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 and reflecting on my role has taken a lot of work and therapy <laughs> at times. It's, uh, it makes me feel vulnerable. And, of course, we're always vulnerable, but some positions and roles, I think, are better at... 
are more humbling. This one is humbling. Yeah, I think that's a <clears throat> that's an exquisite statement of what I think. Well, I really I do think that you capture what the experience is like, whether we're mediating <clears throat> in a small community dispute uh, between two neighbors or a workplace conflict, a divorce, or in the kind of dispute that, uh, not dispute, but the kind of conflict engagement process that you're involved in with the initiative. It's always for us, we know that we can't let our egos drive our decisions. And we all have egos. And they are important to it. That's important to acknowledge both parts of them because we're not robots, we're not machines, we're human beings. And we have needs and aspirations and fears and joys and all of those things that, that come about with our interactions with other human beings. And um, I don't want to say any more because your statement was, as I said, exquisite and very clear. Any last thing, Julian, Gabriela? I, I think the only other thing that is um, on my mind and it's something that you've actually helped me out with, um, Michael, is the, um, and it has to do also with a, a lot of threads of the conversation, is, is, is how to transfer more of the ownership of the network from the backbone to its participants. So we've gone through this, I think, natural evolution where at, at first it was like, hey, everybody come, this is going to be a great conversation to, okay, now that everybody's here, we have to be careful with how we're going to manage the agenda because we don't want anybody to run away with it on their own. We want it to be a collective thing. And, and we grew protective of it, which has a little bit to do with that conversation that we were talking about earlier about steering the thing between, between the collective and the donors but also individual uh, agendas who are not donors who may want to run away with a particular issue or two or the whole thing. Um, you know, we've had pressure from some members to say, you need to do more of this, more of this, more of this. You say, okay, well, you know, I'm, uh, you, you gotta, that's a great to hear your voice and then let's, let's check with the rest of the group to see what they think. I'm doing a lot of that kind of protecting of the center of the group, if you will. And as we did that and developed our legs and our, our tactics and methods and strengths and wherewithal to protect that center, we also probably became, um, uh, we, we, we may now be in a place where we have to let go of some of that and, and trust the group to own it on their own and empower them to do so and step away from that role. So, so from struggling to create it, to struggling to defend it, to now struggling to sort of pass it off, uh, to the group, I think is the next stage of our evolution after these four years, um, and we've been talking about it for a little while. And I think I think now we are in a place where we need to do that. And as as Gabriela mentioned, she's transitioning out, and she's done it in a very elegant way. She has left it uh, the initiative with with plenty of funding, so that you know it's not in a crisis. Relationally, we're in a good moment, and it's going to be a really interesting moment of transition to an, an, a new figure. Um, and I think part of that transition will also include uh, empowering the leaders of the, of the various groups to take on more responsibility for, for promoting the group and for developing the direction in which it wants to go in. And I think that's the future of it. And, and, and you know, speaking of the ego part, you know, we worked so hard to build it and now, now we have to let it go and, uh, and sort of loosen our own, and Gabriela's leaving, so she's gonna loosen a lot of her own control uh, um, instincts, but now for the rest of us, you know, we'll have to manage those ourselves. Well, it is an, it's a developmental process because you, you know, unlike uh, a number of other stakeholder, multi, multi stakeholder interventions of a variety, um, yours has such a long, long arc that the developmental process is more visible because there's more time for each element or each stage of that developmental process to occur, as opposed to being in a six month or even one year process where everything is, is, is it's a bit more compressed and you don't see it as distinctly. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, you've, uh, Gabriela, you've, uh, you know, you've stewarded something 
that um, that now you hope will have a life of its own, that it will be sustained, um, that your energy, your vision, your commitment, your drive, um, all of those things have um, have provided that along with your partners, um, you know, the, the stakeholder partners and the partners like Julian. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. Thank you, Michael. And, and, and I think it's, I don't even see it as a test, the, this, my, my, me transitioning, my, my transition out of the initiative, but I see it as a positive because I think that special because it's, it's challenging to maintain the level of enthusiasm and, 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 and aggregation in a long-term initiative that a change of um, in the leadership style or personality of the person coordinating the initiative can have a positive effect in the long run right. in, in, in diversifying the initiative and keeping it together at the same time. So um, I trust the process. I think that we have helped build a network that will sustain, that will be sustained at least over the next three or four years. And I feel hopeful that what we have is helping build collective leadership, which as you know, is not necessarily the same as individual leadership. And that the person that occupies the role will be in a really good position to, to, to continue helping the, the network, not just grow in number, but grow in terms of what Julian was saying, which is, internal leadership for the for what we're trying to achieve we'll see how it goes yeah. well um, Gabriela and I and Julian Portia I'm so pleased that we were able to spend this time talking um, you know the number of questions that are still buzzing around in my mind are uh, are endless we could go on and on what will go on is the initiative which is remarkable and I think the more you have the opportunity to teach us, not because that's a model, but because it is a process that the two of you have sustained over such a long period of time, um, that there's so much that you have learned that could inform the rest of us in our, in our community. And so I'm glad to be able to add this piece, this, this conversation. Um, to that and hope that others watch this and, and learn immensely uh, from you and have their own questions um, that they bring to it. So thank you both. I'm extraordinarily grateful and humble and delighted um, at this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.